Let's all bow our heads for the closing prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to thank you once again for this beautiful Sabbath day you've given us. Thank you for um, allowing us to safely come to church this morning, um, be with those who are yet on the way, as well as um, I ask that you be with our online viewers as well. Thank you for this opportunity where we can come and meet um, in your house freely to worship your name, God. And thank you for being with the Sabbath School program thus far. Be with us now as we're transitioning into the um, lesson study and be with the men's panel. I pray that you guide this lesson study and may we all be able to learn something more about you, something that we can apply to our lives so we can draw closer to you as well. All these things I ask in your name. Amen. Good morning and a blessed Sabbath to all that are worshiping here in the church and across the globe. It's, we are so thankful to God for this day that he has given us in our lives to come in to his house of worship and praise him. One of the most important part of a church service is certainly the Sabbath school. And as we have gathered here, and we will read from the Word of God together and discuss Sabbath school is like a classroom discussion. It is not a preaching session. So I would like to welcome people that have joined us through broadcast live and may not be physically present, but you are certainly a part of us, and we are grateful to you for this opportunity. The panel uh, members this week are uh, Vijay Jaradi. We will take a day's lesson. Then we have Michael Benazet and Sham Paka and Amar would be joining us. And they will introduce themselves as they uh, present from the word of God. My name is Maxwell Paul. And as we all know that in this quarter, we are studying the, the title is In the Crucible with Christ. In the Crucible uh, with Christ. It's a very important word in our lives. What does crucible mean to us, to me, to you as a person is very important. As we dig into, uh, dig into the study, let's have a word of prayer. Mighty and righteous God, we are so grateful to you for this opportunity that we can come in your presence to study from your word. Heavenly Father, as we read your word and discuss your word, Lord. May our lives be enhanced. <coughs> May we continue to learn from our experiences and be closer drawn to thee. Abide with us, Lord. In your son's name I pray. Amen. Crucible, the definition of crucible as uh, from the dictionary says, that basically it's a vessel or a pot, you want to call it, where you put in a substance, high heat is infused, and it is refined, whatever that substance is. The scripture uses the example of gold because that's something that was very prevalent in those days. And it is 
even to this day, a very important and significant uh, uh, piece of wealth that humanity enjoys. So in that example, when you find that rock and the goldsmith refines it in that heat that is put under the vessel or the pot where it refines it and you get the coal. Or in our personal lives, even though we don't physically put ourselves in those pots or vessels, however, we go through life's challenges. And though that crucible helps us to get closer to God, understand his will, and once we submit our will to him, he will refine us. Now, God is seeking to purify us, to refine us, and to transform us in his image. That's the goal of what the scriptures is telling us. Refine us, purify us, and make us in the image of God. Due to the limitations of time, we will be skipping some portions and some text because I believe we should leave more time towards the end to be able to discuss and get opinion from the congregation. The uh, verse uh, that has been listed by the author for us as Colossians 129. I think Joash read that also in the uh, uh, Sabbath school. To this end, I strenuously contend, struggling with all the energy Christ so powerfully works in me. This is from the New uh, International Version. <laughs> How we go through life Every one of us goes through life differently and experiences things differently. The author has in the quarterly mention or shows of two different people that went through similar circumstances, but the actions were very different. It depends upon how have I, as a person, learn to cope with what has been revealed to me from the word of God and as to how I have tried to streamline my life so that my life is lived in a manner that's in tune with the Lord. Tough question. Everyone has to answer that for themselves. There is no two ways about it. All of us deal with things differently, no matter what the circumstances, the good, the bad, and the ugly of it. Fact of life. In this lesson, basically, if it is to be summarized, the main points are the, that God has given us a choice. He has given us a choice. Secondly, he empowers us in our efforts to get into his likeness. And then our success depends on our determination to follow the path that has been laid for us. Very important steps. You can jump the steps, you can follow that sequence, and God will certainly bless us. Talks of wills and willpower. We all understand that in the human aspect of life, what the role wills play. As we live, usually most people before they pass away, we draw out wills so that whatever earthly possessions we have 
can go to the people, children, the state, charity, wherever we want, can go in that fashion. So that your will is enforced. Likewise, the Lord gave us the willpower. We, he depends on us to make those decisions. With this, we jump into Sunday's lesson that talks of the spirit of truth. All of us, I'm sure means I'll talk of myself. Uh, I can talk for yourselves, but I can imagine that as humans, not we are not much different from each other. We have run into situations where we have cried to the Lord, we have pleaded with the Lord, and have often thought to ourselves, why is this happening to me? Why am I in this situation? Have I done some things that are not in the right fashion, not with the will of the Lord that I'm in this trouble? Those are some of the things that we will discuss and we will get wisdom from the congregation as we move closer into our discussion part. The Lord does not expect us to do everything on our own. He, before he left the earth, he gave the Holy Spirit to us. The Spirit of the Truth, the author, records and uh, uh, references John 16, 13, where it talks of the Holy Spirit as Spirit of the Truth. What in sum summary it says is, He will guide you in the truth. He can bring conviction, urging us to make right choices but he will not decide for us. He certainly, if you go back even from the very beginning, in the Garden of Eden, when he created the first man and woman, and he gave them that power of choice, he could have restricted them from not eating that fruit from the tree in the middle of the garden. But he did not. He could have, but he did not. If he did, the very allegations that the Satan has been saying would be proved right. Therefore, he is there as a guiding truth. He shows us the light, but he leaves unto us me as an individual, to make the right choices. It's very critical of us to understand his will. Sometimes, or a lot of times, we limit him, or rather limit ourselves, because we don't use the full capacity of the power that he wants to give us to make those right decisions. Very critical part of that. The author uses a word here where he says that God cannot make us repent. I would like to deviate a little bit from there and I would like to get a wisdom from you in our discussion later on. I prefer to use the word he won't, because if I say he cannot, I'm limiting God. But that's what the author has said. And we have a right of, uh, to change or think a little differently as long as the fundamentals remain strong and that we follow that. 
So where he says God cannot make us repent, I think we need to uh, discuss or hear from you about whether he cannot or he won't, that aspect. In the book of Acts, uh, I'm sorry, in the book of Luke chapter 17, 14, in regard to the lepers, when Jesus told the lepers, go show yourselves to the priest. It's very interesting to note that the scriptures in red say, go and show it to the show it to the priest. Those were the very priests that had sent them to the leper colony. Now, they still were inflicted with leprosy. They were not yet healed. But it was them following his direction. And the scripture tells us that as they went, they were healed. What does this tell us? Humanity and divinity must come together to affect a change in our lives. And very beautifully, with uh, the pen of inspiration, admonishes us of this in Patriarchs and Prophet, page 528, I believe, uh, I'm sorry, uh, 248, where it talks of where humanity and divinity must come to affect the chain. So remember, because of their faith, the lepers were healed. Jesus told them to go, they listened. They went and they were healed. There are many other instances that you all are aware. But just drawing you uh, towards that. Uh, so, we, as we go along, let's try to think for ourselves. And as we continue studying from this, may the Lord guide us to make those right choices in life. We all at some stage have been through terrible conditions. Some of us have been afflicted physically, some mentally, some spiritually some in various modes, some, for some of us, the scars are visible, for some they aren't, but they carry those scars. There is nobody that's not afflicted because we live in a sinful world. And as we continue studying and worshiping, may the Lord continue to guide us. Elder Amar, is going to take the next uh, day's lesson. My name is Amarendra. I'm doing uh, Monday's portion, the divine human combination. As, the, as we see the question, the very first question in our quarterly, what is your greatest accomplishment ever? It could be anything, depending upon our priorities in life, probably education, or paying off our mortgages, or becoming debt free, whatever it may be, it takes effort, perseverance, and commitment to do that. It doesn't just happen uh, like, just like that. In the context of our study, the only way we can do anything positive is if we do it with God. There's no other way. Whether we understand it, we know it, or we, are we, if you are fully cognizant of it or not, Christ in you is the only hope of glory. I want to take you to, uh, before that, let me say this. 
John 14, 12 says, Verily, verily, say, I, I say unto you, He that believeth on me, the works that I do, shall he do also. And greater works than these shall he do, because I go to my Father. This is the promise God is giving. And whatever he ask in my name, that will I do, that the Father may be glorified in Son. If he ask anything in my name, I will do it. So, as Christians, if we want to achieve anything for Christ, your effort will not yield that great a fruit. It has to be united with Christ's effort. I want to take you back to Old Testament story, the book of uh, Exodus, Moses. Moses was learned in all wisdom of the Egyptians and was mighty in words and deeds. And it came to pass in those days when Moses was grown that he went out unto his brethren, looked on their burdens, and he spied an Egyptian smiting an Hebrew. We know this story. And he kills him and hides him in the sand. And next day when he goes, there are two Hebrews fighting, and he says to them, why are you fighting? And he says, you want to kill like the other day you killed? And certainly he knew that this would go to Pharaoh, and then he runs away. And we know that God took 40 years to teach him the way, and it took 40 years for Moses to unlearn and learn the God's way. And when he was ready, God called him, Come now therefore, and I will send thee unto Pharaoh, that thou mayest bring forth my people. And we see how great a multitude he led them out of the sin, or bondage of sin. Deuteronomy 4, 4, it says, Stick with the Lord and submit to the Lord. And Luke 13, 24, as we have these texts in this quarterly, this is, strive to enter in the straight gate, for many, I say to you, will seek to enter in, shall not be able to. First Corinthians 9, 25, it says, every man that striveth for mastery is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain corruptible crown, but we an incorruptible. The key word is strive, struggle, persevere, endure, is what it says. Acts of the Apostles, page 96.1 says, Christian is to be united with Christian church. Uh, Christian is to be un united with Christian, church with church, the humanity, instru human instrumentality, cooperate with the divine, every agency subordinate to the Holy Spirit, and all combine in giving to the world the good tidings of the grace of God. God has done his part, and Christian activity is needed now. God calls for his experts, his people, to bear a part in presenting the light of truth to all nations. Review and Herald, March 187. Therefore, we need to partner with God, co-partners with God. If not, our work will not be as successful. As Galatians 2.20 says, Not I, but Christ. If Christ lives in me, and if I live that life, and if God reigns supremely on, in me, then I would do the works of God. There will not be a failure. Because this is God's work. He is commanding us. He is instructing us to go. See the life of Paul. He is striving all this so that he can present us to God himself. This is how it is going to be when we strive. With God, may all, each one of us do that. Good morning and... Sabbath blessings to every one of you. My name is Vijay David, and uh, we have the title, The Disciplined Will, for Tuesday's lesson. This is a kind of understanding how our feelings play into our Christian experience. You know, feelings get us into hot water. They kind of bring us the crucibles. They bring trials because we go by our feelings instead of going by, by the word of God. 
lesson, that, uh, Tuesday's lesson starts out by saying, one of the greatest enemies of our wills is our own feelings. We are increasingly living in a culture bombarded with pictures and music that can appeal directly to our senses, triggering our emotions, anger, fear, or lust, without our realizing it. So when you watch a movie or a video, suddenly you are feeling all these feelings and emotions. And pretty soon you are thinking a certain way this, that's uh, nothing or has anything to do with anything. In the book of Revelation, chapter 16, it talks about relationship to the battle of Armageddon and how Satan is everywhere like the frogs in Egypt. The three unclean spirits are everywhere and they are bombarding us with feelings, emotions and desires. And Satan is drawing us to himself in, in the battle with heaven. Feeling is involved in our decision making. We make decisions every day. What kind of food am I, um, am I going to eat today? That, am I going to eat donut or am I, am I going to eat pizza? So you make a decision based on your feelings. Decision in doing something. Am I going to do that or do this? A decision in buying certain things. Do I need to buy that? Can I buy this or, you know, all based on your feelings. And feelings have a place. They have a place and we cannot completely eliminate feelings um, because uh, God made us to be feeling creatures. He made us to use our senses. So we got to allow the feelings to have a place in ourselves. Do our feelings lie to us? Yes, of course, they lie to us. The heart is deceitful about all things and desperately wicked. We see that in Jeremiah 17, 9. And feelings can also create a false picture or reality causing us to make bad choices. So that, uh, what examples of our people do we find in the Bible who made choices based on the feelings rather than on the word of God. And what are the consequences? Genesis 3, 6. This is the fall of Adam and Eve. Elder Maxwell Paul touched a little bit about Adam and Eve. The woman and the serpent are involved in a conversation about the fruit of a certain tree that God told them not to eat. We all know what happened there. The serpent talks to Eve, says to Eve, look at the fruit, how pleasant it is to the eye. Touch the fruit, see how soft and smooth it is. Taste the fruit, see how sweet it is. The e then Eve falls for his um, temptation. So both Adam and Eve are involved in this. Then God comes in the scene and wants to investigate the situation and come down, comes down looking for them. Serpent played with their feelings and, and their feelings seems to be going downhill because they were in hiding. Second Samuel chapter 11. This is an incidence with David and Bathsheba. David was a man after God's own heart. He is faithful. The army is gone, the army left. He's all by himself in his home. So he just goes out and sees a woman bathing. His feelings, emotions, and thoughts overwhelm on him. And he does the unthinkable. He is controlled by his feelings and the feelings dictate him, dictate him as to what he needs to do. Finally, God reaches his heart through Nathan the prophet. God is always seeking 
to reach our hearts, our will and our thoughts that are overwhelmed by the feelings. Feelings overwhelm us at times and Jesus came to defeat those feelings and he did on the cross of Calvary. Jesus himself overcame the feelings and made a decision to pray. Not my will, Father, but your will. Not just once, but three times. We don't need to make choices based on feelings, but we need to make choices based on the word of God. Thank you. Good morning. My name is Michael Benazay. Wednesday's lesson is titled, Radical Commitment. God provides us with everything that we need, but some of us want things that we know we're not supposed to have. A man's eyes wander towards a woman nearby. He doesn't stop there. He begins to have impure thoughts about the things that he would like to do unto her. He is consumed by these evil desires and no longer considers his own marriage or his children. He has no relationship whatsoever with this woman. In fact, he does not know her at all, yet his carnal mind has taken control, and he won't stop until he gets what he wants, regardless of the consequences. Sexual immorality. Jesus Christ has given us a solution to a problem that is plaguing and has plagued countless numbers of marriages and families. The solution is to cut it off. Lust is no different than cancer. Just look at the example of King David. Patriarchs and Prophets by Ellen G. White, Chapter 71. It was the spirit of self-confidence and self-exaltation that prepared the way for David's fall. And instead of relying in humility upon the power of Jehovah, he began to trust to his own wisdom and might. As soon as Satan can separate the soul from God, the only source of strength, he will seek to arouse the unholy desires of man's carnal nature. The work of the enemy is not abrupt. It is not, at the outset, sudden and startling. It is a secret undermining of the strongholds of principle. It begins in apparently small things. The neglect to be true to God and to rely upon him wholly. The disposition to follow the customs and practices of the world. Every effort which David made to conceal his guilt proved unavailing. He had betrayed himself into the power of Satan. Danger surrounded him. Dishonor, more bitter than death, was before him. There appeared but one way of escape, and in his desperation, he was hurried on to add murder to adultery. David reasoned that if Uriah were slain by the hands of the enemy in battle, the guilt of his death could not be traced home to the king. Bathsheba would be free to become David's wife. Suspicion could be averted, and the royal honor would be maintained. Bathsheba observed the customary days of mourning for her husband, and at their close, David sent and fetched her to his house, and she became his wife. He, whose tender conscience and high sense of honor would not permit him, even when in peril of his life, to put forth his hand against the Lord's anointed, had so fallen that he could wrong and murder one of his most faithful and most valiant soldiers and hope to enjoy undisturbed the reward of his sin. Alas, how had the fine gold become dim? How had the most fine gold changed? For the sake of Israel also, there was a necessity for God to interpose. As time passed on, David's sin towards Bathsheba became known, and suspicion was excited that he had planned the death of Uriah. The Lord was dishonored. Nathan the prophet was bidden to bear a message of reproof to David. It was a message 
terrible in its severity. The prophet's rebuke touched the heart of David. Conscience was aroused. His guilt appeared in all its enormity. With trembling lips he said, I have sinned against the Lord. David had committed a grievous sin toward both Uriah and Bathsheba, and he keenly felt this, but infinitely greater was the sin against God. Though there would be found none in Israel to execute the sentence of death upon the anointed of the Lord, David trembled, lest, guilty and unforgiven, he should be cut down by the swift judgment of God. But the message was sent to him by the prophet, The Lord also hath put away thy sin, thou shalt not die. Yet justice must be maintained. The sentence of death was transferred from David to the child of his sin. Thus the king was given opportunity for repentance, while to him the suffering and death of the child, as a part of his punishment, was far more bitter than his own death could have been. In Matthew chapter 5, verse 29 and verse 30, Jesus says, If your right eye causes you to sin, pluck it out and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and cast it from you. For it is more profitable for you that one of your members perish than for your whole body to be cast into hell. Absolutely, the words of Jesus are radical, although it's only because he said what we needed to hear instead of telling us what we wanted to be told. You cannot sugarcoat sin in its effects, not just on the sinner, but also on the other people who willingly participate in sinful practices. There are also consequences that go along with that sin. You see, the Holy Spirit can only show us what is truly separating us from God. If we refuse to acknowledge our own sinfulness, then we will indeed be lost for all of eternity. My name is Sham, and I've been assigned to teach the Thursday's lesson entitled, The Need to Perceive. The very first para reads, we can know what is right and exercise our wills to do the right thing, but when we are under pressure, it can be very difficult to keep up unto God and his promises. That's because we are weak and fearful. Therefore, one of the important strengths of the Christian is perseverance, the ability to keep going despite wanting to give up. That was the case with Jacob. I'll touch a few things of his struggles till he come back uh, to his uh, land of his fathers. Now Jacob had learned from his mother of the divine intimation that the birthright should fall to him and was filled with the unspeakable desire for the privileges which it would confer. It was not the possession of his father's wealth that he craved. The spiritual birthright was the object of his longing. And you all know Rebecca, his mother, played a big role in this whole matter, the birthright. Jacob and Rebecca succeeded in their purpose, but they gained only trouble and sorrow by their deception. God had declared that should receive the birthright and his word would have been fulfilled in his own time had they waited in faith for him to work for them. Now Jacob threatened with death by his brother Esau, he fled his father's house. The evening of second day, he found himself far away from his father's house. Then he started confessing to God the terrible sin that he has committed, like he never before with weeping. He lost all his confidence in himself and he feared that God of his father's 
had cast him off. Here it is. God did not forsake Jacob. His mercy was still extended to his erring, distrustful servant. The Lord compassionately revealed just what Jacob needed. He needed a savior. He had sinned, but his heart was filled with gratitude as he saw revealed a way by which he could be restored to the favor of God. That night, God appeared to Jacob in a dream saying, I am the Lord God of Abraham thy father and God of Isaac. The land whereon he lay as an exile and fugitive was promised to him and to his posterity with the assurance in thee and in thy seed shall all the families of the earth be blessed. And that promise had been given to Abraham and Isaac. In this vision, the plan of redemption was presented to Jacob, not fully but in such parts as were essential to him at the time, says Mrs. White. After 21 years of service, God told him to leave the place and return to his homeland. Remember the prayer that Jacob prayed when he was a fugitive. If God will bring me back in, the, in this way that I go, and I will give him, give me, and he will give me the bread to eat and raiment to put on so that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. Jacob was not here seeking to make terms with God. The Lord had already promised him posterity and the wall was the outflow of a heart filled with gratitude for the assurance of God's love and mercy. It was midnight when he reached to the river Jabbok when he felt a hand on him, so he started to wrestle all through the night. In fact, it was Christ, the angel of the covenant, who had revealed unto Jacob he had power over the angel and prevailed. Hosea chapter 12 verse 4 says, Yea, he had power over the angel and prevailed. He wept and made supplication unto him, he found him in Bethel, and there he spoke with us. Now Jacob's experience during that night of wrestling and anguish represent the trial through which the people of God must pass through before second coming of Christ. Prophet Jeremiah, in holy vision, looking down to his time, said, we have heard a voice trembling of fear and not of peace, all faces are turned into paleness. Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it. It is even the time of Jacob's trouble, but he shall be saved out of it. Jacob prevailed because he was persevering and determined. His experience testifies to the power of persistent prayer. It is now that we are all learned the lesson of prevailing prayer of unyielding faith. Again, those who are willing to forsake every sin and seek earnestly for God's blessings will not obtain it, but all who will lay hold of God's promises as did Jacob and be as earnest and persevering as he was willing to succeed in Luke Chapter 18, 7 and 8, the Lord says, Shall not God avenge his own elect, which cry day and night unto him, though he bear long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Expense offering will be connect, collected at this point. Thank you, gentlemen, for your participation. Greatly appreciate your wisdom. 
Now, it appears to me we are probably running a little behind schedule. So, and Pastor tells me from there, I, we had several questions that we would or, uh, like to have you all participate. So we'd kind of limit those to about two. And I take from the last page that uh, of, from the Friday's uh, uh, notations, I'd certainly like to read from this uh, Pen of Inspiration, Testimonies, Volume 5, page 515. This will that forms so important a factor in the character of man was at the fall given into the control of Satan, and he has ever since been working in man to will and to do his own pleasure, but to the utter ruin and misery of man. Sometimes it appears because either we have disobeyed and have not repented that we are in a crucible. The number last, number four on Friday's question is something just a couple minutes to hear from you. What is it that I can do in all practicality and in relation to? Is it that God cannot do or he won't do? We'll probably a couple minutes, if somebody has a point, two minutes, somebody has a point. Okay, Mohan, if somebody would get them a mic, please. Psalm 34, 19, it says, Many are the afflictions of the righteous, but the Lord delivered him of them all. Anybody else? I guess I don't see any hands. So keeping uh, with the time factor in mind, I'll request uh, Michael if you'd offer a prayer as we finish the lesson study. Let's all bow our heads for prayer. Our most loving kind, merciful, omnipotent, omnipresent Father in heaven, giver of life and provider of everything that we have. Father, we are so thankful, so grateful to you for allowing us all to be here on the Sabbath morning in thy sanctuary, in thy presence on another sacred Sabbath day. Thank you, Father, for all of the blessings that you bestowed upon each one of us. Thank you for protecting us throughout this week, for bringing us here safely, for allowing us this short time to be here and to worship you. May everything that we do bring glory and honor to your name this morning. Be with the speaker of the hour as well as he breaks the bread of life to us. Forgive us each one our sins and shortcomings. And finally, grant us all a place in your eternal kingdom for ask all these blessings in Jesus' holy name. Amen.